Cool. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Keegan Rush. I'm a freelance software developer from sunny South Africa. I know I don't look like an African, but uh, born and bred. Um, so today I'm going to, I want to share a story with you about a project I worked on last year. So we were building this app. There were about uh, three people building the mobile app, two people on the server side, and I was leading the mobile team. So we built an architecture, or rather, uh, it was kind of my fault. So I built an architecture in which we thought it was a great idea. We were trying to build the perfect architecture for a mobile application. So we're talking about how do we handle routing in the app? How do we handle uh, network calls? What patterns are we using? Everything pertaining to the code that gets reused inside your application. And we ran into a lot of problems with this. Uh, our architecture is actually what crippled development. It actually slowed us down to the point where we couldn't release new features. But before I start sharing with you the reasons why this happened, uh, I want to be clear. Architecture is important. So there are way more benefits to architecture than there are to problems. So I'm not going to be talking about the good parts, but just realize that it is super important. Clean code is good. But now we're going to talk about some of the bad parts. So on this, uh, on this project we were doing, we were using all of the best tools, all of the coolest, shiny tools in the toolbox. Uh, we were using Rx Swift, we were doing reactive programming, and we were strict about that. Everything was an observable, and everything was in the reactive mindset. We were using Viper, which is an architecture pattern, sort of like uh, MVVM or MVC, used very much on iOS applications. Um, we were strict about that as well. Everything fit into there very well. We were using a dependency container for dependency injection. Um, Anything that was depended on had to go through that container, no exceptions, very strict about that. And everything was tested. So we had good test coverage, but we were also testing the most important parts of it using a Cuckoo, a mocking framework. Cuckoo is a great library, but it created some bugs for us, but uh, we'll get into more of that. And one final thing uh, for routing, for actually navigating from one screen to another, we use a concept of flow operations. Um, this is sort of like a custom thing that we built in this application. Uh, flow operation, as we defined it, is a subclass of operation, which is NS operation from Objective C. That means it's great for concurrency. An operation basically manages a um, sort of like a wrapper around a function. It's sort of like any anything you want to do, you can put it into an operation. So that could be a network call, could be navigating to another screen, could be anything you want to do on a background thread. So the operation we wanted to do was a flow from one screen to another. Um, cool thing about operations is they can have dependencies. So that means my operation won't execute until all of its dependencies are executed. So the reason this is quite cool is if I want to view a profile inside an application, that's dependent on being signed in. So you have a view profile flow operation, which is dependent on the sign in flow operation. So if I try to view profile and I'm not signed in, it's going to force me to sign in. And we have a global queue, a global queue of all the operations over there. And when we want to add an operation, we just get all of the dependencies, add self to it, and add it to the global queue. So you're always guaranteed that there's just one stream of flows that will happen in the application. You don't want two of those to happen at the same time because you only have one screen on a phone. Um, when we actually want to display view controllers, we get an observable because we're in Rx Swift mindset. Remember, we get an observable of view controllers from the presenter because we're using Viper. Don't forget that. And we subscribe to that observable. Uh, once we get a view controller, we tell it to display. If the observable completes, then the flow operation is done. So you actually exit the flow by completing the observable. See how everything in this very complicated architecture ties together quite nicely? Um, here's an example. So we would have to remember, if we want to start the, this certain flow over here, we would remember to put it on the background queue. Uh, otherwise, it's going to block. So this is a long-standing thing, and we don't want it to block. We create an actual flow operation. We tell it to begin so it actually starts, and we tell it to wait until finished. So the next flows aren't going to jump in front of it. So it looks quite cool. 
And uh, there were a lot of good things about it, which I've talked about. I was quite proud of it. Um, we used objects called routers. And routers, uh, they knew of flow operations. They contained all of the flow operations. The flow operations knew of presenters from the VARPA side of things. And the presenters knew of view controllers. And view controllers, as they should in any application, knew nothing. So it's a great architecture, right? And we are using, you're doing everything cleanly. Everything was following a good pattern. It sounds great. But it actually ended up being a problem for us. So with all of these complicated patterns we were following, things became hard to use. It was actually quite hard to, to actually build a flow if I'm using those flow operations. Or it was quite hard to keep up to date of how Rx Swift ties into Viper. So what happens when things get hard to use in your architecture is people follow the path of least resistance. And when people follow the, everything follows the path of least resistance. Look how water flows down a stream. We do what's easiest to us. And when your architecture is too complicated, the easiest thing is putting everything inside a view controller. That's why we have massive view controllers. And the problem is when people don't use the architecture properly because it's too hard to use, and when people aren't consistent because they follow the path of least resistance, we end up with bugs. So we had all of the code that was meant to help us to ship new features. And this was actually giving us issues and problems. There was just too much going on. So we had too many things under the hood that we had to keep in our heads as we were going through. So going back to that example of the flow operations, you've got a observable of view controllers. And you must remember to tell that to go to the next view controller. Otherwise, nothing's going to happen. We've, we need to make sure to put that on the background thread. Because if you don't, you've got a long running thing that's eating up the main thread. So nothing's going to go on on your main thread. So don't forget to put it on the background thread. When we create the flow, we need to remember to actually tell it uh, to begin. We need to then tell it to wait until it's finished. If you don't, you're going to run into problems. The next flow is on going to display. And when you complete it, you need to tell that observable that it is completed. So that's a lot to keep in mind for something that's usually as simple as getting a navigation controller and telling it to display the next view controller. We've taken something that is fundamentally quite simple, which might have some problems if you don't have a good architecture in place, and we've overcomplicated it. It's not necessary to add all of this overhead in this example. Um, oh, and there's another one. There's another big problem. So with the dependencies, which I really liked, where your view profile screen is dependent on signing in, you can create circular dependencies there. So you can create one screen that's dependent on another and vice versa. So nothing actually happens. I think the app actually crashes when that happens. So we've seen this example of how it can cause problems in the framework of your application and the architecture of your application. But it's not just the scaffolding, what we were building, that can be problematic. There's other parts to it as well. Every time you write a class, you are building an architecture. If your class is used by another class, which it is, otherwise doesn't, exist, doesn't need to exist in your code base, um, you've created an architecture. You're defining some rules about how you operate with that class. And these same patterns or these same mistakes apply then. You can fall into the same problems. And you can also see it in third-party code. Third party being open source, third party also being foundation and the Swift standard library and UI kit. And one example from the Swift standard library is strings in Swift. So if you remember strings from Swift 2 and 3, strings were not collections. And the reason that they weren't collections was it's not a simple array. Uh, strings are actually very complicated. So I've got a few small examples that I've got. Um, from the release of Swift 2. Uh, there was a blog post released by Apple about this. So if you get two Unicode characters which make up one particular uh, character in Korean, if you look at that first string and you look at the second string, the actual value of the string, or rather what's between the quotation marks, doesn't look the same. But they evaluate to the same Korean character, and therefore they are equal. So that creates some problems if we're trying to treat it as an array. A string is not necessarily an array. Those two have very different counts, but they are equal strings. That's sort of like getting an array of UI colors, one of which is red and one of which is green, and then assuming that red and green make yellow, because that's what colors do, right? But we can't treat strings like that. 
you can't get a fish and get some rice and then say it's equal to sushi. So in Swift 2 and 3, uh, strings weren't collections, and that was very technically correct. That was the right way to do things. One could argue that Swift 4 is less correct in that because it is a collection. But Swift 4 is much easier to use. We, um, we prefer working with strings in Swift 4, which is why the community moved over to this, uh, this approach in Swift 4. So what are the green lights when we actually want to do a good architecture design? What, what should we get out of it? It should be easier to work with. So we don't want something that actually we have to worry about the technical details. I don't want to worry about Korean characters when I'm creating a string or I'm trying to treat it as an array. I don't want to worry about those things. Your architecture should also be an enabler for your application. And when you have very complicated architectures like I had in mine when we were worrying about how to create flows, it doesn't become an enabler. It becomes a barrier. And your architecture is there to make things easier. It might look easy now to drop everything into a massive view controller, but if you leave that for a year or for two years and you keep adding features, it's just going to get worse and worse, and you won't be able to build new features. So your architecture is there to help you. It's not to hinder you. And another thing we need to be careful of is mental overhead when we actually are fleshing out our applications. You don't want to worry, again, about Korean Unicode scalar uh, values when you're working with a string. I don't want to have to go reference those blog posts on Apple sites every time I'm trying to figure out why the count of two strings are different, things like that. So there's a few techniques we can actually use to get us towards that green light sort of application where it is easy to use. Always use the right tool for the job. So if you are going to Warsaw from here, you probably need a train or a car. You can't take a bicycle. But most of us aren't doing that. If you're just trying to get to McDonald's, a bicycle works fine, or an Uber, or something like that. Um, obviously, if you're at SpaceX, this doesn't apply to you. You might need to go the more complex route, but most of us aren't building mission-critical systems. Most people worry about, and, and should worry, about duplication in a code base. So we follow the draw principle. Don't repeat yourself. We remove duplication wherever we see it, wherever we see it. But Another approach to follow that's been quite beneficial to me is called the rule of three. What that means is the third time you write a bit of code, that's when you need to actually remove that duplication. So you write it once, and you maybe copy and paste it, but the next time you actually see that pattern coming out, there is something there that you need to abstract away. You abstract it away, you create a method that actually wraps that, and that's your new abstraction. But we need to avoid incorrect abstractions. And what an incorrect abstraction is, is when you get code that looks very similar, and just because it's the same few lines of code, you try and put it inside the same function, or you try and reuse something for something it shouldn't be. That's why you end up with uh, strangely named classes. You've got a something manager or a, or a this builder, because it doesn't actually make sense for your business. It's not a good abstraction. So only ever pull your code out into an abstraction uh, away from duplication if it actually makes sense. And another approach you can follow is the YAGNI principle. And YAGNI stands for you ain't going to need it. And what that means is don't abstract code away or don't write the code in the first place if it doesn't actually solve a problem. So I'm here tonight because I like writing code and I assume that's the same for most of you. We like writing code. But a lot of the times when we're actually doing work or trying to provide business value, it's not the coolest code we need to write. It's usually the simplest that's the most valuable. So we need to stop and look and see, is there a simpler or easier way to do things? Are we overcomplicating the systems we build? Are we actually going to need it in the future? And again, if you're working at SpaceX, this probably doesn't apply to you. But uh, for most of us, it's, it's quite a good principle. So. If you follow these principles, I'm hoping that you will end up with an architecture that is easy to understand, something where you can go and look at your code and actually know what's going on. Not like me when I was building these slides and I tried to find my code examples, but they didn't make sense to me, so I had to spend hours trying to understand my own code. You want to end up with code that's actually easy to build, so it must be easy for you to write the first time that you're writing it. You shouldn't be debugging threading issues, 
or uh, worrying about the underpinnings of the operation class or stuff like that. Build something that is as easy as it needs to be to get the job done. And of course, it should be easy to use. Once you've built it, make sure that this is actually easy to use by your fellow developers. Or if you're, use, if you're creating a class, make sure every other class can interact with it without, without troubles. So, basically, the main point of what I'm trying to say is we don't always want the most, we don't always need the most technically correct approach if there's something that's actually easier to use. We are here because we enjoy it. We want to make sure we write code that's actually pleasant to work with as time goes on. And sometimes that's not the swift string that handles scalar values. And sometimes that's not the uber cool flow operation that uh, manages all its dependencies. Sometimes it's, it's extremely simple and gets the job done. Any questions? Hi, Gene. Hey. Uh, what was the solution for, the, for all the problems in the app? Give up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, so interestingly enough, actually, um, there were other problems. It was basically a side project, but a funded one. And there were other issues that led to the project stopping. And thank goodness, because I was reaching the point where I, I'd probably have to scrap everything and start again. Um, I, I would never suggest that anyone does like scrap an application to, to redo things. But what I would say is I would stop using what I did have, stop using that pattern, keep what did make sense. And all new features, I would just follow something much more simple. But what would you change? Like, would you skip the Rx Swift or choose a different architecture? We used uh, Rx Swift for everything, so it was absolutely everywhere. I would stop using it except in a few cases where I could see a need for it. So by that point, we did have an understanding of how it works. So we could probably say like 70% of the time, we didn't need Rx Swift. There were maybe a few cases where it was very beneficial. I would, um, I would keep using the, the dependency container, but uh, only for when it really is important. I would scrap that whole concept of flow operations. I would stop using Viper until it got to the point where we had enough developers and enough features that we needed something that was so distributed and uh, separated. So I'd keep the code that is there. I'd keep it as an option. I would just say, do it on a case-by-case -case basis going for the simplest possible where you can. I hope that answers the question. Cool. Anything else? Do you think it's easier to like scale down from architecture or scale up? Like, I mean, the, the problem is too complicated. And yeah. You make it simpler or you build like only massive view contro controllers and then you, you're like, oh my God, what, what have I done and what, what now? So that, that, that's an interesting one because it's sort of like we sometimes we want to build. I'm talking to you now about building for the problem that you see and not the problem that doesn't exist yet. But you do want to build it in such a way that when things get complicated and they're going to get complicated, that you actually can scale up, like you say. So I think the middle ground there is not building for what's going to come because you can't see what's going to come. There are a million different alternatives of how your app's going to change. And if you are building for something that isn't there, you're choosing one. Um, so I would say to rather build for change, build with, with change in mind. So keep, keep those, uh, maybe I should just leave that unlocked. Everyone likes Homer Simpson. Yeah, okay. So um, I would say to, to build with change in mind, keep things, keep things sort of modular. So what I do is I usually split it by feature. So I've got one folder where my one feature is in. I've got another folder where one feature is in. What that means is when the next feature comes out and we're like, okay, we've got eight developers on this project now and it's getting really complicated. Maybe, MV, maybe we went back to MVC. And it's not working anymore. We need to now reconsider Viper. Then we can change it for the, for the next one. And of, of, of course, there are things under, underlying a feature, which is common. So you can't really use that on a one feature basis. So with that in mind, I would say just, just keep it in mind that you always want to be improving your architecture. You'll get a much better architecture by doing it just in time when you've seen a need for it than by trying to build it up front by saying, like, we know we're going to be doing uh, routing, so we need these flow operations. And we know that RxSwift can be good when we need it, so we're going to use RxSwift everywhere for when that time comes. That was the mistake. We should have waited until we actually did see a problem where RxSwift was beneficial, and then we pull it in. 
And so when did you realize that something went wrong? When we were building the flow operation part of it and, and most of the RX Swift stuff as well, uh, most of the bugs actually came from building the framework. So it's like, I'm not even looking at a feature. I'm not even looking at something that the stakeholder will want to see, but we were seeing bugs and we actually can't get it done. And you can imagine that Apple actually saw these issues when they were building, when they were building some stuff in UIKit. But they finished it, they fleshed it out, and it's there and it's working. So we should have just adopted that. that that's when we did see problems. Another thing I would say is when, so that, that's bugs, but another thing I'd say is when development just like sort of like slows to a halt and we're worrying about handling those issues. There's another telltale sign, which is people are following the path of least resistance. People were not using these cool new things that we built because there was so much to keep in mind. So we saw bugs, we saw people not using it, and when we did use it, it just wasn't easy. Yeah. yeah I have a question. Uh, you said that you were very strict about uh, all those dependencies and about your archi architecture, that, that it needs to be used everywhere. Would you consider uh, using it in general, but then in some specific cases going uh, easier way, like using MVC in some cases? I, I would say, so you're asking what did we do or what should we do? Uh, what should you do? I would go sort of the opposite and go for simpler and go more complicated when you need to. Um, now I would say if, we, if you are following something quite complex and you do see that uh, maybe MVC is better suited, then I'd say that's a great approach. But I would say an even better one is to assume that you're going to do no Rx Swift and you're going to do MVC or MVVM, I actually prefer MVVM, and um, scale up when needed. But, but definitely, I think the problem that we started off was, it was, it was sort of like religious, you know, like it has to be done like in this way because it is technically, technically like it made the most sense, you know, we didn't have to worry about like globals and passing around a navigation controller and stuff. I mean, the view controllers didn't even know how they're being displayed. It could have been modal, it could have been in a navigation controller, no one knows, so it was great. But um, I, would, I would have rather done it the opposite way. Awesome. Thank you.